Nothing could have prepared me for that moment. In the middle of the freezing river, half submerged, a raccoon sat hunched. I knew what I was keeping for that, as I had followed Mitch the day before, and watched him conceal a trap under the water. I've seen and documented firsthand so much animal suffering that I have a huge memory bank of tragedies that just won't fade away. From time to time, something will happen which triggers a recall for a particular moment, and I'll be forced to go back over it in my head, reliving it just as I saw it. Only once that's passed, when I return to what I was previously doing. But this racking was different. I think about it almost every day. For its demise, it's one of the most upsetting things I've ever seen. I was in North America, a deep public health infiltration project for a coalition of non-profits who wanted me to go up and then fur trapping. I exposed it this industry had never been achieved before, so this project was of high value to the anti fur movement, but it's also high risk. While most fur is farmed these days, around 15 to 20 percent of global fur production is still sourced from the trapping of wild animals. Just as it was in the 16th century, the Native Americans first began trading their animal furs with French explorers. North America is the key producer. Between three and five million wild animals are trapped there for the health of the year. Few things stay the same over the course of 500 years, but fur trapping hasn't strayed too far from its roots. That's apart from the fact that people now wear fur for high fashion rather than the basic necessity of staying warm. And while trapping equipment has evolved a little, the actual act of trapping a wild animal hasn't. Figuring out a good location, setting the trap and applying the scent to make it attractive to a particular animal. It's an knowledge that gets passed down from father to son or trapper to trapper, and because of that, the stories stay pretty much the same. So, over the course of two winters, I learned to become a fur trapper, a bad one, a trapper that showed enthusiasm and a passion to get out into the great outdoors, but who couldn't catch anything himself. To the trappers, I was useless and oddity, and a bit of a laughing stock. But while I couldn't capture animals, I could capture the activity of the trappers, and I was good at that. So these are a few images from that project. It's um, a two-year project, and like I said, fur trapping really hasn't been gone too much. But maybe they can copy the pocket stories that we might have as kids. Uh, the raccoon I was talking about was this one on the left. Uh, yeah, I won't go into too much detail about that. But uh, what I remember, the last impression of this was that after his demise, when he was drowned, uh, he came out of water in the hands of the trapper, and I saw one of his paws were missing, and he'd actually been in the trap before. And it's quite common for wild animals, when they are caught in let go traps, to, to basically ignore them on their own limbs. So this, this raccoon has experienced that before this case. Yeah, trappers are uh, well, you can imagine a very uh, cruel group of people, but they're actually very normal people as well. Um, I managed to integrate a series of groups in the States. And the first I left after a week, um, they were they were quite a dangerous bunch, I would say. They were they were prison guards that worked in a maximum security prison during the night and they trapped almost like a pack, you know, hunting across forests and field over the over the day. ATVs and yeah, I felt very sorry for the inmates actually. And um, I chose it that was a, that was a group to leave after about a week and that's my chance to go. But then I met a series of other trappers, you know, one was a professional, um, <coughs> this guy here in the middle. Um, yeah, he traps a lot of red box mistakes. And of course these first go into the international fur auctions and then I saw the fashion houses across China and Greece and Italy. But it all starts here, you know, with a basic trap. Um, guys trapping during the day. Some of the trap lines would be 80 miles long, um, of a couple of hundred traps set underwater <coughs> for beavers or on land providing by ocean. Um, and then also, you know, you have the victims that probably weren't working at all. Um, so like the stunt, for example. Um, it wouldn't be enough for them to like actually deal with it, so just shoot it. And also documented by kind of family, family animals that are important to us because they're just completely indiscriminate. Um, like cats, for example. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's a pretty uh, horrendous industry. I mean, obviously, it props up the 
fur in the street, you know, going to pigs and troughs on those campaigns, but um, perhaps getting into a bit of a trough at the moment. But yeah, it's a lot of animals still being trapped across North America, and everything from black bears, uh, lynx, coyote, uh, red fox, gray fox, um, muskrat, mink. It's, 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 it's a big, it's a big campaign. Um, that's an example of one of the, one of the projects that I've involved with. Yeah, the next one I'm going to talk about is uh, rabbits. <laughs> At the bottom of the supermarket trolley were a bunch of baby rabbits. As white snow with ruby red eyes, they sat motionless. Behind the trolley was Claudia. She must have been in her own 70s and had tightly curled silver hair. Slight afraid, she moved effortlessly through the hours as she grabbed the baby rabbits from the trolley and tossed them up into the empty cages. When the cage had been filled with six rabbits, she slammed the door firmly shut and began the process to get in the next cage. At the end of each trial, she was spot to top up the trolley with more baby rabbits, crammed into neatly stacked crates that had been left out by my fellow workers. I was stood at the end of one of the aisles. As she passed by me, she kept her head low, save for the slightest of nods, acknowledging my presence. I was struck by the familiarity of the scene as I looked back down the aisle, which now sparkled with hundreds of white eyes. It was a fact of fun, but it felt like a supermarket. The product was visible on the shelf, and though not yet canned, the rabbits were already behind metal. The artificial lighting suspended underneath the metal canopy felt oddly familiar too. So yeah, at the end of uh, 2010, 2011, um, I started investigating this industry across Europe. First in the UK, we had rabbit farms that were producing uh, rabbits for meat um, and for food use in some laboratories. And but more commonly um, on the continent in France, uh, Spain, Italy, Greece, where more than 300 million rabbits have the factory farm conditions. Just like factory cages for hens. Uh, in fact, the numbers are greater. Um, and one of the things about the industry is that the mortality rates are probably the highest in factory farming, so plus 20%. Um, they're really delicate animals, as you can imagine, and um, trying to fit them into the factory farm system is um, something that you know, really does end up with a lot of casualties. But one of the interesting things about this project is I spoke about Claudia, the expert. Um, but one country in particular, Italy, um, many of the factory farms are, are owned, owned by, by women and managed by women. It's the first time I've ever seen that across the world. Um, and I've done primarily factory farm investigations. Really, so. Um, so it's kind of unusual. And some of the reasons that they would speak to me about is that they were managing these farms on the right. And whilst they had husbands and siblings, they often did get involved with the work. And some of the farms that actually spoke about it in terms of like, you know, the rabbits gave them company. And one of the things I found interesting over this, this, this period of doing this work is, is how um, factory farmers and people that are flawed to animals, that are trappers, for example, how they justify what they're doing. And some are open, you know, open, you know, confessing that.
certainly at like a high level, retail level, you know, some of the corporates are moving away from that, the big chains. Um, I kind of feel like the writing's on the wall. And one of the things I wanted to talk about today is like from these investigations that, you know, the images obviously can be quite hard to see and you know, can bring up emotions in us. But I do want to tell you that on the ground, working with these people, there is a level of fear about their industries um, that I've noticed over the last couple of years that I haven't seen before. And it's a fear that society is changing. Society doesn't want to see animals kept in cages for, for, for meat production. Um, but we're really, really concerned. And particularly a lot of the farms, the rabbits, you know, they're, they're not talking about selling the farms to others, they're not talking about that. Kids want to take them on, you know, the kids don't want to do um, So I think there is a societal shift starting. Um, so I want to let you know, like, behind the doors of the back of the farm, there is fear. Um, they're quaking in their boots, um, they know that change is happening, and um, I think we should all be quite excited about that. Thank you. So I've got a couple more. Um, So, growing chicken industry in the USA, I've done a lot of work in the US, um, particularly on this issue because it does, the scale is just so huge. Um, but let's start with this excerpt here. Chip's baseball cap looked like it had been to his head. I couldn't imagine him without her. It was beige with a dirty motif that wasn't legible, and the pink sat just above rounded glasses from which his blue eyes looked out. He wore a pale blue and white striped shirt. In striped dungarees, also in blue and white, and dirty brown boots. He reminded me of the paper. <coughs> he said nothing when Bob greeted me. She looked tired and slightly disheveled, in a dark brown t shirt and white trousers, which sat high on her waist. I didn't ask where she was from, but her accent sounded more East Coast than the slow paced crawls I had become accustomed to at Central Kentucky. Chip and Bob owned a chicken factory farm, but not for much longer. They wanted out. They were selling up, and that's why I was there. Each year, eight and a half billion chickens are reared and slaughtered in the USA. That's more than anywhere else in the world. The chicken industry is a roost ruled by just a handful of companies. In turn, they contract thousands of individuals like Chip and Bar to grow birds. Under these contracts, the growers, as they're known, are given chickens by the company and set up requirements for production that they must meet to keep their contracts alive. And the chickens they're given aren't any normal chicken. All of the big producers use what's called a fast growing breed. These birds have been genetically selected to grow to a huge size in an incredibly short period of time. They'll go from chick to oven ready in just seven weeks, and they're cheap. But while the shopper makes the savings, the cost of the chickens well for adding up. That's why I was there to document that it wasn't really easy. And it wasn't easy because this was around the time that uh, a term called Ag Gag came up. You may have heard about it. Um, but it was basically the sort of uh, intensive agriculture movement in the US trying to shut down investigators exposing what was happening on factory farms right across the USA. And um, that's probably them, actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, they were very worried about um, activists getting jobs on their farms and you know making this pain to them um, getting their out. Because the chicken industry really is really horrific. I mean we're talking about we're talking about infants basically. Um, you know, they get a slaughter within 48, 42 days. Um, they arrive at the farm um, same day that they're born out of the egg. And the only time they leave the farm is on their way to the slaughterhouse, which would be about 30 minute drive. So they get about 30 minutes of fresh air in their short lives um, while they pass, you know, rolling past over and um, you know, some birds are going to be flying inside. Um, but their lives are incredibly short and, you know, their bodies just can't keep pace um, with the, the growth, the genetic breeding that's taking place. You know, skeletons can't support them and it's you know, quite typical. Um, Leg injuries, you know, birds can't carry themselves across the water drinkers in their last sort of week or so of life. Um, but when I talk to people like Chip and Bar, you know, their, their rationale for um, 
the scale of the industry and the way that they keep these birds is we're feeding America. And that's pretty much how they justify it. And they're not interested in the birds themselves. I mean, the term that I used earlier is, is growers. They all talk about themselves as growers. They don't even talk about themselves as farmers. Um, they're just growers. And they're just kind of babysitting, really. Uh, they don't own the chickens, and they just own the infrastructure to keep chickens uh, growing. Uh, it's the, the, the big companies that own the chickens. Um, and they're just there, basically, to, to keep an eye on them. I think, I think they don't really keep an eye on them. They're more interested in going fishing, um, you know, in terms of, like, culling, like, you know, uh, culling animals if they're in stress. Like, you know, they'll be okay, it's another day, and they'll be going out anyway, so let's just leave them how they are. Um, that's pretty much uh, America's chickens and grow, and obviously 30,000 plus birds in the shed. Um, and it's the same in the UK, same system, same problems, um, same horrific uh, smells of honey. And um, yeah, it's, uh, it's a pretty sickening trade. Um, and this bird, I don't know the end story of this bird, I really wish I did. Um, but. This is the sort of house in the background. She was on the truck as well. And she fell off the truck. And, uh, I kind of always think about, you know, why did the chicken cross the road? I know the one. I know the ending of this bird, but in reality, I don't know the ending of this bird because I got told to move on and I couldn't come back to her. But yeah, it's a pretty big trade. Really big in South America and China, obviously, as well. Um, and yeah, it's, it's so, just to come back to another maybe a seasonal issue um, reindeer. You might have seen like a few years ago. This really sort of unique way of life. Um, you know, part of the region of Europe that you know, hasn't been lost culturally, and so so much of our traditions have, have been lost. Um, but we still hold on to groups like the Sami for, for many of so keeping their traditions intact. And perhaps you've seen those documentaries where you know the, the reindeers are you know, sort of driven down from a uh, uh, the highlands, the mountain grounds, to the to the lower grounds, sort of over the winter, and you know it's an amazing sight to see. You know the herd of reindeer like travelling as they do, um, but then you've got to think about why they're doing that, and it's normally at that point that the BBC pack up and leave. Um, not just the BBC, much of the TV crews that documented some cultural tradition, but the reality is that. While some families may keep a reindeer or two for themselves, um, the true horror is that reindeer are being packed up into commercial trucks like that, livestock trucks, in the middle of the high Arctic and you know, driven um, to commercial storehouses. And they need the same pay as you know, the pigs, uh, cows, um, the pigs that they need, need the same storehouses. Um, Talking quite big numbers, you know, 150,000 plus, you know, across Sweden, Finland, and more in Russia and Norway. And what's interesting for me when I did this project um, is that most of the meat that's used, and it is sent to like uh, high end restaurants in Europe, I mean, it was gone through little for a little while a few years ago. Um, but most of the meat is from the calves, like the, the top left there. And they would be about five or six months old when they're slaughtered. And while I was doing this project, it was about this time, actually, um, a few years ago, uh, I realized that these reindeer were actually being killed before they would ever see Christmas. And I know maybe you know, there might be two and for the morphing, but I kind of felt that odd that uh, you know, most reindeer actually don't live long enough to reach Christmas. They are being run through commercial slaughterhouses. And the commercial slaughterhouses that I was able to think of a lot of them there, um, 
for a semi while then I'm gonna have to rank it up. <coughs> yeah, well, I'm working very well at all. You know, it's a really super stressful place to put a rank up for a small box. I mean we're talking about a room, you know, three or four meters square and three or four rank there, um, you know, that's so high. I'm coming in there and just being chased around the room while one guy tries to put a bullet in the head. Yeah, whether you know you're coming from a rights perspective or a welfare perspective, none of us is right in whatever way you look at it. Um, also the journeys, you know, the truck was trying to get you know two hundred reindeer into a two tier truck, really, really stressful. Um, yeah, the catcher, you know, it's, it's basically just running around with the rest of the match trying to grab all the animals to the ground, um, sawing off reindeer, um, animals trying to sure that they can fit them into the animal trucks. And um, yeah, it's just a tradition that if it wasn't for um, the animal rights movement and they're interested in like, kind of getting the truth and gathering the evidence and wanting to put it in front of like decision makers like for this project the Morley Council, um, you know, we won't see that through mainstream television. It's, it's just not um, something that would be acceptable. But the biggest irony of all, when I finished this project in Finland, um, I've been for a few weeks trapped herders and trying to find them now in the Arctic, which is another story altogether. Um, the biggest slaughterhouse house I've found was on one, one side of a fairly big city, uh, for, for Finnish scales anyway. Um, and yeah, they were you know, processing you know, many hundreds of reindeer each day. And, on the other side of town was the, uh, the big Santa theme parks um, where queues of tourists, you know, all the languages you could hear in the world were queuing up with their children and just patting a little rainbow on the head as they go into the entrance. On the other side of town, the, the big thing was really happening. But, you know, if you don't know about those things, um, unless we go out and search. So yeah, I spoke a little bit about personal well-being uh, well earlier. Um, I think I've managed to get quite okay. Um, I've certainly probably struggled in the last year or two um, by the process of like writing this down a little bit. It's helping, I think. Um, I tend to do a lot of projects where I have been in places for quite long periods of time, where I have the kind of um, points where I'm able to get into the world. Room system, so, um, and I am having to be around people that I you know, wouldn't want to, to be in contact with ever again. Um, some of them, like I said, uh, yeah, I don't care at all, not interested in what they doing for a living. Um, others are there that you, know, you could probably send some elements to the compassion in there, just probably bring them out. But then there's all kinds of things, you know, there's abuse happening to animals, but there's abuse happening to humans as well. You know, lots of migrant workers working at like, pig farms in Italy, for example, um, seeds. You know, some families are trying to, you know, drive me to get their families out of the country on you know, the farms. You know. There's a lot of suffering goes on in the meat business, I would say. It's a, it's a pretty nasty business, and um, there's a lot of people involved with that. Have quite significant links to you know, other criminal activities as well. So we don't have to look too far to find out um, where a lot of what's bad in the side of society comes from. And I would certainly say you know, factory farming is a good place to start looking for those individuals. Um, so yeah, um, I, I've finished, finished up on these projects now. Um, I've been doing a bit of training with um, some new people, um, uh, trying trying to once get involved with this documentation and keep things going. I mean, I think last year when I saw the film Oxygen, I don't know if any of you saw that, mm -hmm. but you know, it was quite a mainstream reference to you know, this type of work within the animal rights movement. And for me at that point, I thought, oh, hey, this is yeah, really getting into the mainstream now. And I think perhaps it's a good point for me to, to walk away from it. Um, but of course, we're going to have to continue to document and gather evidence because 
you know, these industries are still continuing. Albeit they are getting smaller, but you know, if, if it wasn't down to the, the movement, you know, we wouldn't have this kind of evidence. You know, we wouldn't be able to put in front of people, we wouldn't be able to create big films like the for example, Earth Names or the House for the um, So we're going to have to keep watching. You know, we always need the eyes um, to be vigilant and to, to keep getting these stories out there. But I'm hoping that will be a less of a need from that over the, over the next few years. So um, the last little thing I'm just going to, you might see me at the front door. Um, um, so the, there's two things I mentioned earlier is that I'm working on a book at the moment with Unbound Publishers. Um, they're like a mainstream British publisher. They tend to support uh, projects, you know, maybe on the edge of counterculture that like do the mainstream a little bit. So they like this this, this storytelling um, uh, out through an Instagram account. Um, just show in a second. But yeah, I have been uh, writing these these chapter stuff, and it's crowdfunding to get uh, to get basically the publishing costs covered, uh, the legal, the editing. Um, so I'm about 40 percent at the moment, so I need to get 60 percent to make sure that the book then goes into the mainstream. So I'm hoping that the animal rights community will rally around me a little bit and help me get these stories into a place where they can um, portray into the mainstream. Because I don't want them just to sit within the community, and I want to make sure now I'm finishing that I can you know, tell every story that hasn't been told. Because a lot of the stories. Yeah, the images that you've seen have already been used by the groups that I've done the projects for. But there's certainly stories behind those stories that I feel need to be told. And I'm trying to get people to help me um, get those stories told right now. So yeah, I've got a crowdfunder at the moment um, going on. Um, you can find the details at carlsnetronintendent.com. Um, basically, you're just pledging for the book. Um, so yeah, if you make a pledge, like a digital pledge for a tenner, then you'll get a copy of the book. For a paperback, and then I've got a few other different reward levels. I've never done a crowdfunding before, um, so it's yeah, it's a bit of a journey in that front. And having not come from a sort of social media background, um, I'm to find my feet on it kind of quickly. But they're a good group. Um, yeah, some pretty successful books have come through it. So if I can get it up to that 100 percent mark, then yeah, we'll basically go up and go into the mainstream. It's part of Penguin and House. Yeah, I just want to get these stories told, so take it to life if you want, on the way out, or remember the grab address. Sorry, I've got three minutes. I asked for that kind of support. Yeah, so that's the leaflet, you might have seen it, or it might have some of the tables. Um, and then if any of you are on social media, I run, I run these pictures with like the kind of um, with the narrative went through Instagram, um, so it uh, explains a little bit what's happening with the story and, and my sort of feelings at the time. So yeah, you've got to follow me on that. Um, but thank you so much for coming. Um, 1345, I was due to finish at 1345, so maybe if you didn't like what you heard, don't have me, but happy that I finished on time. <laughs>